after 50 plus video, so that will be around two months, we have finished three chapters plus the introduction. So that would be here, it says page 104, around a quarter of the book. So in that case, we would probably finish around yeah, 100 pages times four, but around 200 for years. <laughs> so it will take us around two, around six more months probably, or so we, we can probably finish by this year. Which is, I think, pretty impressive. So before we dive into chapter four, any questions so far or any comments? How do you guys like the book so far? All like it? Okay, okay, cool, cool. Okay, if no comments, let's dive into the chapter four. The happiness visible in this present life. Introduction. Is it the case, as some scholars hold, that the Buddha's original message was exclusively one of world transcending liberation with little relevance for people stuck in the routines of worldly life. Did the ancient Buddhists believe that it was only in the monastery that the real practice of the Dhamma began and that only those who left the world were considered proper receptacles of the teaching? Did the Buddha's teachings for the laity have no more than a token significance? Were they mainly injunctions to acquire merit by offering material support to the monastic order and its members so that they could become monks and nuns, or prefer, preferably monks in future lives, and then get down to the real practice? These are all the questions that will be answered in this chapter. Firstly, let's take a look at a few difficult words here. Receptacles. Receptacle here means an object or space used to contain something. Yeah, I think that would be the most appropriate definition. So is it the case only those who left the world were considered the proper recipients of the teaching? And then here, injunctions. An authoritative warning or order. Let's take a look. Were they, were the Buddha's teaching mainly an order to acquire merit yeah, by offering material support to the monastic order yeah, so that they could become monks and nuns in future lives? Yeah. They here means lay people. Okay, that would be the opening questions that the Bhikkhu Bodhi set in this chapter. Basically, is the teachings only for monastics and not for the lay people? It will be answered in this chapter. Next paragraph, Sister Saiken, would you like to read? At certain periods, in almost all traditions, Buddhists have lent support to the assumptions that underlie these questions. They have spun concern with the present life and dismiss the world as a valley of tears, a deceptive illusion, convinced that the sign of spiritual maturity is an exclusive focus 
on emancipation from the round of birth and death. Monks have sometimes displayed little interest in showing those still stuck in the world how to use the wisdom of the Dharma to deal with the problems of ordinary life. Householders, in turn, have seen little hope of spiritual progress in their own chosen mode of life and have thus resigned themselves merely to gaining merit by offering material support to the monks. Thanks, Sister Sakya. So here, Vigo Bodhi says, at certain periods, this, uh, this could be true. And Buddhists have lent support to the assumptions that underlie these questions. Uh, some monastics have displayed little interest in showing us how to use the Dhamma to solve our daily, ordinary problems of daily life. Yeah. With that being the case, the householders yeah, only have yeah, offerings as the means to gain merits, yeah, at least during these periods. Okay, next paragraph is the Choi Pon, which you like to read. While the Nikayas reveal the crown of the Buddha's teaching to lie in the path to find a release from suffering, it would be a mistake to reduce the teachings so diverse in the original sources to their transcendent pinnacle. We must again recall the statement that a Buddha arises for the welfare of the multitude, for the happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the good, welfare and happiness of devas and humans. Page 50. The function of a Buddha is to discover, realize and proclaim the Dharma in its full range and depth. And this involves a comprehensive understanding of the varied applications of the Dharma in all its multiple dimensions. A Buddha not only penetrates to the unconditioned state of perfect bliss that lies beyond samsara, outside the pale of birth, aging and death. He not only proclaims the path to full enlightenment and final liberation, but he also illuminates the many ways the Dhamma applies to the complex conditions of human life for people still immersed in the world. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Sister Chaikwan. Okay. Okay, here, Bhikkhu starts with acknowledging that the Nikayas reveal the crown of the Buddha's teaching, the core of the Buddha's teaching, lie in the path to final release from suffering, which is the noble effort path itself. Yeah. But, however, it would be a mistake to reduce the teachings so diverse in the original sources to the transcendent pinnacle. So let's define pinnacle here. Here is the peak, a high pointed piece of rock, the most successful point, the culmination. So here, while acknowledging, yes, that is the core teaching, Bhikkhu Bodhi says, it is a mistake to reduce the teachings. Yeah? So diverse to only this teaching. Then Bhikkhu Bodhi points our attention to the statement that the Buddha arises for the welfare of the multitude. Yeah, so here, Bhikkhubodhi added, the Buddha not only proclaims the path of full enlightenment and final liberation, but he also illuminates the many ways the Dharma applies to the complex conditions of human life for people still immersed in the world. Yeah. In this case, all of us here. Okay. Next, Sister Aikim, would you like to read? 
the Dharma in its broadest sense is the immanent, invariable order of the universe in which truth, lawful, regularity, and virtues are intricately merged. This comic Dharma is reflected in the human mind as the aspiration for truth, spiritual beauty, and goodness. It is expressed in human conducts as wholesome bodily, verbal, and mental action. The Dharma has institutional embodiments as well as expressions in the lives of individuals who look upon it as their source of guidance in the proper conduct of life. These embodiments are both secular and spiritual. Buddhist tradition sees the responsibility for upholding the Dharma in the secular domain as falling to the legendary will-turning monarch, Raja Chakravati. The will-turning monarch is the benevolent ruler who governs its kingdom in accordance with the highest ethical norms, Dhammiko Dhamma Raja, and thereby peacefully unites the world under a reign of universal justice and prosperity. As text 4.1 verse 1 shows, within the spiritual domain, the Buddha is the counterpart of the will-turning monarch. Like the later, the Buddha relies on the Dharma and reverses the Dharma. But whereas the will-turning monarch realizes, relies upon the Dharma as principles of the righteousness to rule his kingdom, the Buddha relies upon the Dharma as ethical and spiritual norm to teach and transform human beings and guide them towards proper conduct of body, speech, and mind. Neither the will-turning monarch nor the Buddha creates the Dharma they uphold, yet neither can perform their res respective functions without it. For the Dharma is the objective, impersonal, ever-existent principles of order that serves as the source and standard for their respective policies and formulations. Okay. Thanks, Sister Akim, for reading this long paragraph. Okay, I think here the important thing is uh, talks about the will-turning monarch. So let me highlight that here. What is the will-turning monarch? It's the benevolent ruler who govern his kingdom with the highest ethical norms. Yeah. And thereby, peacefully unites the world under reign of universal justice and prosperity. Here, this is also not, uh, not worthy. Neither the will-turning monarch nor the Buddha creates the Dharma they uphold, yet neither can perform their respective functions without it. Why? What does that mean? Because for the Dharma, it's the objective, impersonal, ever-existent principle of order that serves as the source and standard for their respective policies and promulgations. Let's take a look at these words, promulgations. The word promulgate here means promote or make widely known uh, an idea or cause. Okay, so that's for that paragraph. Next paragraph, Sister Billy, would you like to read? As the king of the Dharma, the Buddha takes up the task of promoting the true good, welfare, and happiness of the world. He does so by teaching the people of the world how to live in accordance with the Dharma and behave in such a way that they can attain realization of the same liberating Dharma that he realized through his enlightenment. The Pali commentaries it demonstrate the broad scope of the Dharma by distinguishing three types of benefit that the Buddha's teaching is intended to promote 
graded hierarch hierarchically according to their relevant merit. One, welfare of happiness directly visible in this present life, Dita Dhamma, Dita Sukha, attained by fulfilling one's moral commitments and social responsibilities. Two, welfare and happiness pertaining to the next life, Samparaika Dita Sukha, attained by engaging in meritorious deeds. Three, the ultimate good or supreme goal, paramata, nibbana, final release from the cycle of rebirths, attained by developing the noble eightfold path. Okay, thanks, Sister Billy. Okay, here the Pali commentaries distinguish the broad scope of Dharma by distinguished saying three types of benefit that the Buddha's teaching is intended to promote. What are these three? The first one, Sister Billy has read, welfare and happiness directly visible in this present life, yeah, which is the main focus of this chapter. And the second one, the happiness in the next life. And the third one, the ultimate good, the supreme goal which is Nibbana. Okay, let's read a few more paragraphs. Let me take a look. While many Western writers on early Buddhism have focused on this last aspect as almost exclusively representing the Buddha's original teaching, yeah, the last aspect here means the Nibbana. A balanced presentation should give consideration to all three aspects. Oops. Therefore, in this chapter and those to follow, we will be exploring texts from the Nikayas that illustrate each of these three facets of the Dharma. Okay. Uh, next paragraph is the second. Would you like to read? The present chapter includes a variety of texts on the Buddha's teachings that pertain to the happiness directly visible in this present life. The most comprehensive Nikaya text in this genre is the Sigalaka Sutta, uh, Dika Nikaya number 31, also known as the Singalovada Sutta, sometimes called the lay person's code of discipline. The heart of this Sutta is the section on worshiping the six directions. Text 4, uh, 1.2, in which the Buddha freely reinterprets an ancient Indian ritual, infusing it with a new ethical meaning. The practice of worshipping the six directions, as explained by the Buddha, presupposes that society is sustained by a network of interlocking relationships that bring coherence to the social order when its members fulfill their reciprocal duties and responsibilities in a spirit of kindness, sympathy, and goodwill. The six basic social relationships that the Buddha draws upon to fill up his metaphor are parents and children, teacher and pupils, husband and wife, friend and friend, employer and workers, lay follower and religious guides. Each is considered one of the six directions in relation to its counterpart. For a young man like Sigalaka, his parents are the east, his teachers the south, his wife and children are the west, his friends the north, his workers the nadir, 
and religious guides, the Zenith, I think it's down and up, with his customary sense of systematic concision, the Buddha ascribes to each member of each pair five obligations with respect to his or his or her counterpart. When each member fulfills these obligations, the corresponding direction comes to be at peace and free from fear. Thus, for early Buddhism, the social stability and security that contribute to human happiness are most effectively achieved when every member of society fulfills the various duties that before them as determined by their social relationships. Each person rises above the demands of narrow self-interest and develops a sincere, large-hearted concern for the welfare of others and the greater good of the whole. Okay, thanks, Mr. Second, for reading this long paragraph. Uh, this one, worshipping the six directions, I think you will uh, probably encounter this Sutta before. It's, it's pretty famous. Okay. We will cover this in detail when we read the Sutta. But uh, basically, someone has been worshipping the six directions and the Buddha guided him at how to do the six directions correctly. Here, the Buddha highlighted six social relationships, parents and children, the first one, teachers and pupils, the second one, husband and wife, the third, friend and friend, employer and workers, lay followers, and religious guides, the last one. Okay, I think here would be a good time to stop. Any questions or comments? Not uh, as sister, well, sister Kim like to do the dedication. Yuan Xiao San Zhang Zhu Fan Nao, Yuan De Zhi Hui Zhen Ming Liao, Hu Yuan Zhui Zhang Xi Xiao Chu, Si Si Chang Xing Pu Sa Dao, Amitofo. Can we meet again? We will be guided by the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Have a happy Wednesday. Bye everyone, see you guys next time.